Please rewind this cassette. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my review for Bong Joon Ho, his new hit movie. This movie's a fucking hit. It's made like a hundred and twenty million dollars. Um, Parasite, which uh, is the film of the year according to most critics, and it seems to be audiences around the world. Everybody seems to be loving this movie. Uh, what's my history with Bong Joon Ho? What's my history with this filmmaker? Well, as many people know, I'm a fan of Memories of Murder. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Not just one of my favorite movies of the last decade, but the decade before this one that's ending right now. Although many people are saying this is the film of the decade or at the very top of the list. So having said that, um, I like all of his other films to varying degrees. I think The Host is probably the greatest kaiju movie ever made, uh, if you want to call it that. Uh, I like Snowpiercer. I like that film he made for Netflix, although that's his weakest film for me. Uh, South Korea makes the best movies in the world. Can we just say that? South Korea makes the best movies in the world. They have been now for like 15 years. All of the great filmmakers today are from fucking South Korea, except for like a handful of people from other places. But uh, somewhere along the line, South Korea became the new Hollywood of today. These are the Scorsese's, the De Palma's, the Francis Ford Coppola's of our time. Uh, Park Chan-wook and obviously Bong uh, Joon-ho is in that is in that category. Um, and rightfully so, um, because he's shown now uh, over his career to have not only a technical prowess, but a tonal mastery that he is able to essentially make a film that is goofy, slapstick, kind of absurd comedy, melodrama, uh, satire, metaphorical, allegorical, what have you, while also just working as a movie as a straightforward story. Um, so this film is being called his masterpiece. This film is being called, you know, his greatest achievement. Um, and like I said, it, I mean, it looks like it might be the first foreign film to have a real shot at winning best picture outside of maybe Roma. Uh, but it's definitely, it seems like a lock for foreign language film. And I think original screenplay, which Tarantino is probably going to be pissed about, but fuck him. He already has two Oscars. He doesn't need another one. Now, I don't think this is his best movie. I'm going to say that. I don't think this is his best movie. I do think you could say this is his second best movie. Third, what have you. Excuse me. <coughs> My bad. Uh, this is probably his second best movie behind Memories of Murder, which I still think is his best movie, obviously. Uh, that goes without saying. I, I don't think he'll be able to top that. Now, Parasite is so far my favorite movie of the year, though. This review is going to have spoilers, too. I'm not just going to uh, talk about the movie in a, in a way that's left open. I'm going to go through the whole fucking movie. So if you don't want to have this movie spoiled for you, don't watch this video. That's That's really as simple as it is. I was surprised by this movie, and what a pleasant feeling that was to be surprised I went to my local art house cinema where I looked like this uh, with my beard and my beanie and all that. I looked like a hipster asshole. And I knew I would be there with a bunch of other hipster assholes who were there discussing as I was standing there to get popcorn. Hey, man, have you seen Knives Out? Please tell me you're going to see Knives Out. And then they start talking about the Mr. Rogers movie and saying that it's shit before we see it. But we have to go see Knives Out from the great Ryan Johnson ironically i go to a bar after i see parasite last jedi's playing on a tv in the background clearly somebody who works at that bar is fucking with me and i know who you are uh but a surprise um i tried to avoid spoilers on this movie i did know what it was about i did know that it was about a family sneaking their way into a rich family's household i did i did know that just from reviews and reading about it i didn't know what really happens in the middle and i really didn't know where it ends up, but I kept hearing comparisons to Get Out, which, you know, had me a little scared because I don't love Get Out, but I, I like Get Out. But I get what they mean. It's a it's a genre-bending movie, 
and it's one kind of movie or it's at least set up as a movie a comedy and then it turns into uh, more of a horror thriller type of film which i was pleasantly surprised by although i i gotta say there was like six or seven different places i thought this movie was gonna go um which i guess was part of the manipulation there there was a big there was a big part of me that thought that some characters knew what was going on and that was the whole you know switch of the movie was that this these characters actually knew what was going on and that was going to be the surprise but that's actually not what it is the movie's actually got a twist in it that i don't think most people will expect and at first i didn't i didn't like it necessarily because i thought the things that i thought where the movie was going was more interesting but then i thought well isn't it good that it went to a place i didn't see coming instead of these other places that i thought you know logically is where the movie was going or naturally organically where it was going so this movie begins with this family folding goddamn pizza boxes in their basement that they live in they live in a shithole uh literally it's a shithole it's the shittiest home i've ever seen in a movie they can't get wi-fi on their phones they steal wi-fi from people they have to go into the bathroom and and put their phones up near the toilet so they can get a signal and they fold goddamn pizza boxes these are the laziest uh pieces of garbage i've ever seen but there's more to them than what's presented to us in that moment um so i'm gonna call him kevin the, the son of the group, who had this John Cusack vibe, who was, by the way, phenomenal. This whole cast is phenomenal. Really like the kid in this. He has a buddy who comes to him and says, listen, I got this girl that I teach English. I'm her tutor. I got to go away. Um, why don't you go in and tutor her? I'll cover for you. Just give them some fake papers. You can do it. You got this. And he's like, I like the girl too, so take care of her. First mistake, bro. You leave your buddy with some chick that's hot, and you tell him tell him to watch over her. Fucking idiot, man. I don't know. Maybe Koreans don't know game. Anyway, he goes to the house, and he's like, holy shit, this is the most beautiful home of all time, which it is. Being in this home had this relaxing feeling to it. It reminded me of seeing the film Ex Machina, where you kind of just like hanging out in that house that Oscar Isaac owns. It's just something so tranquil about it uh the, the the design of the house is astonishing and they make a point to emphasize that that the house was beautifully designed so he starts working there and of course him and the girl get a little crush going um the mother is fucking ditzy as all hell she's this airheaded uh, no connection to reality uh sort of person the father is always working he's the head of a big corporation the kid is clearly like crazy, but they try to claim he's a genius um, because he does these horrible paintings that they're trying to pass off as some kind of genius thing. And then, of course, you have the sister and you have a housekeeper, you have a driver and so on. So what happens is Kevin uh, is in the house and he starts to look around and realize, you know, I can scam these people a little bit more than what we're doing. And so he decides, I'm going to find a way to get my sister in on this as an art teacher for this kid. So he brings his sister in. And this is when the movie starts to get really good. This is when it turns into like Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, or the original play that was based off of. This is where the con begins. This is a con movie and a comedy and a good comedy. The funniest movie I've seen in a long time. It's it's really fun and entertaining to watch this family slowly start to get their way into this house and and some of the stuff they do is just like inspiring it's sort of like brilliant it's like wow it actually would be very possible to do some of this stuff to just bullshit your way and into something like i've always struggled with not being a manipulative person in this way for negative a negative outcome where you're actually like hurting somebody or taking from them uh because movies like this there's things that these characters do. In particular, the sister does something where she takes off her panties and leaves them in a car so that the driver will get fired. And then because of that, the father can become the new driver. And then they, there's a point where they need to hire a new housekeeper. So the father gives a card to the dad and says, hey, call this service. They wanted me to, to work for them. Fucking brilliant. 
And then they make this excuse up that the housekeeper has tuberculosis. And they do this thing where there's a box of pizza and they have this packet that looks like blood and they use that later on a tissue uh, to show that. These kind of details, this kind of uh, just writing shows the masterful nature, world-class filmmaking that, that Bong Joon-ho brings to this movie that is non-existent in 90% of the movies that come out. You want to know what makes a great movie? Really, what does? Keeping it simple, coherent, having... Oh, I hit the mic. Having clarity, you know, keeping things simple. This movie has a lot of simplicity to it, even though it is a complicated movie. There's a shot where they're holding the cell phone up to try and get signal, and you just see... The phone, you know, near the ceiling. Very simple shot. But it's stuff like that. Uh, the 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 land the 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 statue thing that the that the friend gives to Kevin that's supposed to bring fortune to the family. The father being um I can't remember what it's called, but it's when you like spin a ball around a string that he was he did that when he was younger and he has a medal for it. Uh there's details like this throughout the movie, visual details. And story details that play out over the two hours. And with that, those things start to register in your mind. Very simple visual ideas and stuff like that. And they reinforce what's going on thematically. This movie's about class. This movie's about uh, the wage gap and, and the poor versus the rich and the means. Now, I thought this was going to be a fuck the rich movie from the reviews I was reading from overwhelmingly leftist critics who were saying that it was, you know, primarily a... Uh, you know, a, an angry film ab about class. And it feels very relevant to America and where we're at right now. What surprised me was that there was a nuance with that, that it wasn't the rich people are evil stereotypes and the poor people. Really, if you look at this film, if you're being very, like, objective, the poor family in this, the main characters in this, are the bad characters in this. They are not good people with what they do. What they're doing is wrong. It's unethical. It's illegal. Um, it's selfish, really. You know, the kid the kid conning his way into the house to teach the girl, that's not so bad. He needs money, his family's poor, his friend finds a way for him to get a job to make money, and he can teach the girl. So that one I can give a pass to. You know, that's not so bad. It's when they decide they're going to bring everyone into it and how they, they get other people fired is when they really show who they are. Not only that they have this manipulative streak, that they are con artists, but that they, they don't seem to care about others, even though they hint at caring about others throughout the movie. But I think their acts in general are selfish. So he he's not criticizing the rich as much as I think some critics are wanting to put this out there like that. I mean, maybe I'm missing it. Maybe I'm missing some of the deeper subtext, but I think it cuts both ways. I think this is just as critical of people not aspiring to anything, laziness, um, materialism, that they think that all they need is money or they need this house and they'll be happy. And they didn't realize what they had as a family when they were together in that basement, that they were close and living together. And really the tragedy that unfolds uh, uh, um, by the end of the movie comes about by them clinging on to this materialism of things that they don't have, that they think this will complete them. And I never really thought that the, the rich family came off that villainous. I mean, they say things, there's a whole thing with the father or the family doesn't like the way that they smell. And he particularly doesn't like the other father, uh, the way he smells, the driver. But I don't think that's that bad. They try to make it this big deal, but it's like, why does he... <laughs> you know, like what, he can't dislike people that smell bad? I don't like things that smell bad either. I, I mean, maybe my bias is showing here, but I don't... I never really thought they came off as that bad of people. Uh, so for me, it, part of the fun of the movie was that the characters were following who we do end up caring about because it's a comedic movie that slowly turns into different movies every, every like 45 minutes or 40 minutes or so it turns into a different movie. Uh, part of the amusement to me was that this film didn't show, you know, the lower class as, uh, altruistic as perfect that they are flawed too, which I thought was very clever. I love the sister character. I would marry this woman. Uh, she's the smartest of the four. The way she cons her way into there, the way she hacks, I just adored everything that she did. But those little details I was talking about, little little objects, little things, uh, story beats, terrific. And that's really what makes the film. It's that, the acting. This is some of the best acting in an ensemble I've seen in a long time. 
and the cinematography, which sets the tone. It sets the atmosphere of the movie. That's the big thing with cinematography. Uh, think of Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk and how the cinematographer really set a sense of tone in place. The cinematography here is top tier because it immediately sets the tone for the movie and the film works because of that tone. And when the tone shifts happen, it really gets away with it because to have a film with this many tone shifts to play within so many genres and have so much going on, to have this such a clear, beautiful, you know, composed widescreen shots, just these amazing, immaculate, beautiful shots mixed with all of the other things going on really makes this a standout movie because of that. It stands out because of those elements coming together. You know, I could think of this movie being done differently where it could be done with more uh, handheld camera work and, you know, a little bit grittier, but it's so polished and stylized and so beautifully cut. And, you know, the way the edits, the way it cuts and flows and all that is Mwah. it's terrific uh as a filmmaker this was inspiring i was sitting in the theater and this reinfused it, it it reignited the thing inside of me that why i like to make movies and why you like to tell stories because you see something like this and you're like this is why movies fucking exist this is why i like to watch movies this is why i like to you know think about movies is to go see movies like this where almost an analysis isn't even worth you know worth it it doesn't warrant an analysis i could give my in-depth breakdown of what this movie all is but it's really just an experience a movie that is really great a film that is truly great does not need to be broken down and analyzed it can just be enjoyed for what it is because you're involved in it when you're watching it you're engrossed in the movie you don't you don't need to explain it. It's there. You get it. The filmmaker made it very clear. And Parasite is that. Who are the parasites in the story? They are. The family are the parasites. They are parasites to this rich family. So that whole first part of the movie with them taking over, that's so fun. And probably the highlight of the movie for me is that first hour. I would have had no problem had the whole movie been that, that had that tone uh, I even thought it was going to get to the point where the girl was going to find out that the boy's family was this and she was going to help him because they were together. And it was going to be this really sweet story where the boy and the girl, uh, you know, you know, she like she doesn't like her parents. That's where I thought one storyline was going. Then I thought at one point, maybe the dad and the family, this rich family knows what's going on. And this is going to turn into like some fucking funny game shit, you know, where he tortures them or it turns out they're they're serial killers in particular when you find out that there is a you know hidden bunker underneath the house when that point comes in i thought this was going to turn into a horror film straight up i was sitting in the theater like holy shit what is down in that bunker but it's not what you think it turns out that the old housekeeper has had her husband living down there for a couple of years because he owes money that he can't pay so she keeps him down there and feeds him. So there's already a parasite inside the house. Now that's a clever twist. You think that you're watching this family become the parasites and live inside this house, but there's already a parasite inside the house. There's already somebody else who conned their way into this because they can't, they're poor too. So so that that was a really fun... Now this is where I have some of my flaws with the movie, which are very minor. I do feel like this is when it gets contrived, and I've seen some critics praise it for its more fantastical elements than it gets away with this. I find it very hard to believe. The first the first hour to me felt realistic, at least to me. I think all of that seemed plausible. I don't know if I can buy that the same night that the housekeeper comes um, and there's a storm uh that she comes over is is that night when the family goes on a camping trip there's this really fun segment where the family moves into the rich family's house and they basically you know drink and take baths and lay in their beds and like live like they're rich but in one night the housekeeper comes you find out this guy's down there in that same night the family calls they're coming back home early so in a very exciting sequence everybody has to go hide and uh, and they text each other throughout the movie. It's a very clever thing where they're all texting each other to communicate, to tell each other what's going on. So they're all hiding and texting, and, and the kid comes home, and he wants to go outside in a teepee. And uh, this sequence is, don't get me wrong, it's terrific, but isn't it coincidence that all this is happening in the same night? That And that the little boy wants to go outside, and that they're all stuck under the table right there, 
and the couple is sitting on a couch right there at the table. So they, the, the mother, father, I mean, not the mother, the father, sister, and son are all hiding under the table there. And then in that same night, they leave there and escape and go back to their home, their shithole, and it's been flooded uh, with, with sewage water and, and the storm coming down. So all of that happens in one night. This is a long sequence. And I, I'm sorry, it's just, I, I give him credit, he does get away with it because it's so entertaining. You're so into that stretch of the movie. The flood sequence is marvelous. It's so beautifully shot and thrilling. It's like, if somebody did a Katrina movie, they should do stuff like, I mean, it just looked great. Um, and it was it was painful to watch and, and see what each one of them grabbed was very important. But the fact that this all happened at, in the same night... I just had a hard time with that all of these events happened that same night. It was entertaining. It was fun. Like I said, he gets away with it due to execution. But from a writing standpoint, that is a huge leap in believability for me. And I'm sure some people are going to defend it, but that's just too many coincidences for me that all of that happened at the same time. Um, at that point, I knew where the movie was kind of going. I figured because of the smell thing and the father and, and his relationship with the other father, that it was going to end with, you know, people getting killed. Um, but the, the movie starts to get dark, man. This is when it turns into a South Korean film. For a while, it doesn't fit into any... It's it's world cinema. You could see an American remake of this movie in the first hour, and I think they're going to do an American remake of this movie because it's a blockbuster. This is a movie that could make $100 million. Um, and it doesn't feel too at home with being a South Korean film. I think this film would have been good as a French movie or as an Italian film. It uh, kind of breaks culture and uh, territory, uh, it, which is one of the great things about it, is that he's able to do that, and he's, and he's really grown as a filmmaker. Um, so I, that first part, what was so great about it, was like, yeah, it was just a great, entertaining movie, but then it does turn into a South Korean film when... You know, when you go down and there's this bunker underneath and and especially where it ends up. But there's a scene where the housekeeper, she gets kicked down of some stairs, which is very funny in her. And she gets a concussion and she's dying and she's telling her husband who uh, communicates through Morse code through lights in the house, which is another little detail. And they bring up how the boys and Boy Scouts. And so they know Morse code, which they use at the end of the movie with this beautiful sequence. It's these things that he does in this movie, the the lights being Morse code, the the backstory that we don't need explained, but we just see. It's all that stuff that makes this movie brilliant. It makes me think about it uh, is, is all of that that minor stuff that adds up to a beautiful piece of work. Um, so she dies in a very dark sequence where she's like, I'm dying, I'm dying basically and she tells her husband that and he's trying to get someone to come help him but the little boy doesn't really have he writes like help my um and they go back the next day to the family for a birthday party after their house was flooded and they all get invited to the birthday party coincidentally so um they're all there and the kid's obsessed with native americans he's wearing you know stuff that's pretty offensive actually um and they're going to have this big surprise birthday party cuz they're not doing the camping trip so this is where everything comes to a head. Uh, the son goes back down to the, the basement to see what's going on with them. He's like, are you guys okay? He finds the dead woman and then gets attacked by her husband who is broken free from being taped up uh, by the father character. And then he gets chased and then he gets the statue slammed into his fucking head. And I thought he was dead. I mean, when you see a character laying on the floor and there's a big pool of blood, you're like, well, this guy's dead. And I'm like, this is fucked up. I was so tense because I really didn't know what was going to happen. I had an idea what was going to happen, but I th I didn't know if everybody was going to die. Um, this is what was exciting about the movies. It all builds up to this last, like, 15 minutes. You know, and it also, uh, another thing to point out, as, praise, as much praise as, like, Tarantino gets for doing nonlinear storytelling... Or, or other filmmakers when they do fancy editing, or even David Fincher, you know, is really great at this. I think of The Social Network or something. This movie's just on another level to a lot of other filmmakers with that. that the, the way that they do, you know, time jumps or sequences out of order or how a scene, a, a audio will, will help transition one scene from the, the other. You know, this could have been a three-hour movie. I could have watched more of the minutiae of them taking over this house. 
and how everything develops but he he tries to keep the pacing up it's not a slow movie so he does a lot of these things very quickly and it's just done with these terrific transitions and just and different music choices it's not one kind of score there's electronic music there's drums there's more opera classical um which is is also part of the movie that it's so many genres that it's playing with it's also playing with music and editing techniques that keeps changing up which you know could really feel like a mess in the hands of another filmmaker this really does put like get out and jordan peele in perspective that he's he's the imitator this is the master it really is very clear when you see something like this that everyone else is the imitator to the masters and we're dealing with the master when you see something like this uh and uh, you know the irishman just came out too so we're in a good time we're in a very beautiful time joker's the best movie of the year fuck you i'm sorry i, I don't dislike the joker but fuck you like go see this this is a much better movie than that on literally every level Joaquin Phoenix is brilliant. Everyone's better in this movie than Joaquin Phoenix and Joker, and I fucking mean it. This is more impressive acting. This is better writing. You can quote it. You can call me a hipster. I don't care. I don't care. Go watch Knives Out. Go watch Knives Out and give it like a 9 out of 10. Although I did see the trailer for Knives Out before this, and I was like, it doesn't look bad. One annoying thing, though, is every time I go to my art house cinema... Uh, the last like year and a half, every time I go, there's a trailer for some independent film where a, a, a black character gets shot by the cops or sees a cop shoot somebody and that is on the run. I remember seeing the blind spawning trailer with that stuff and then this new movie with like black Bonnie and Clyde. It's like, is this is, is this genre just going to get played out like the Twilight Zone episode of the new Jordan Peele Twilight Zone, like this whole you know, the cops killing black people. It's like, you know, it's not subtext at that point. You're just doing that in this kind of patronizing way to try and make your story feel powerful. I'm getting really fucking sick of people using that over and over. It's very lazy. You know, you could get that message across through metaphor. You don't have to literally do it every time. There was that other film that came out, I think it was this year, was this year last year where it was about the girl's boyfriend who got shot? Um, which, what was the name of that movie? It was some, like, YA, critically acclaimed movie that nobody saw. Kind of like Booksmart. Remember when that was supposed to be the hype movie? That was supposed to be the next Super Bad? It was Super Bad, though. They were right about that. So in the end of the movie, the guy comes upstairs. He goes to kill the wife because the wife killed his wife. Um, he stabs the daughter, uh, when she has the cake for the little boy, the little boy has a seizure, everything goes crazy, it's chaos, um, the mother and him start having a fight, and then the father of the poor family eventually kills the father of the rich family after he sees him rubbing his nose from smell because he's so pissed off. The underlying performance that has the most power in this is from the father, from one of the great actors, um, in Korean cinema. He starts off as the goofball. He starts off as a silly background character. But really, it's him that is the statement more than I think anyone else because he's suffered the most. He's failed this family the most. And where he gets to at the end of this, where he just, you know, he's just so frustrated with his life and how he feels and uh, this respect thing and masculinity and... And the conversations he's had with this guy that he just gets this point. I knew it was going there. Halfway into the movie, I was like, he's going to kill this guy. Um, but that that it even went there was just so... It, there's a speech he gives to his son where his son says, you know, what was your plan? You had a plan. And the father tells him that you don't make plans. The only good plan is not making one. Because when you make plans, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Which really hit hard. Like just just to f just fail, just just suffer. So don't make plans, uh, because they just disappoint you. Which I don't totally agree with, but I get what the movie's saying about that. That trying to plan your life out doesn't really work out. So he he stabs the guy, and then you know he runs away. It's chaos. Kevin is being carried away. Um, the son lives after getting beaten the head with this thing and blood. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible to survive that. I know it's possible, but. I was surprised that he wasn't dead. Turns out the sister died who got stabbed like in the shoulder area. She's the one who ends up dying. 
Um, unless she got stabbed somewhere more fatal and I didn't see it. Uh, but it's really heartbreaking. You know, it's because they got greedy and they got stupid that they were all living in the house together when the family left, that they were milking this, that they were trying to get more out of this that led to their daughter dying. Had they just stayed with the gig that they had going, the con that they had going, they could have played this out and just, you know, made money and, and got a nicer home. But because of that, they they fucked everything up because they, they wanted the materialist things. Um, and, and the flood happening was an unexpected thing, which is very true to life, that things are starting to go good for you and then everything starts to fall apart. So this movie ends with this beautiful, like, last 10 minutes where it just gets so poetic uh, and gets pathos where the the father, and this reminded me of a lot of South Korean films, made me think about things in Old Boy. He goes and, and, and also reminded me of this movie, uh, The Secret in Their Eyes. He hides in the, he's hiding in the bunker now, living in the bunker like the guy before. He's doing what that guy did with a new family living there and he goes up and steals food. And the son and him end up communicating through the Morse code, through the lights in the house, which was established earlier. So the son knows that his father's there, and the son starts writing back to his father that I'm going to have a plan, I'm going to get rich, and I'm going to move into the house one day. And we start to see this. We start to see a montage of the son now going to the house rich. Now, I thought this was a flash forward at first, or it was left to interpretation. I said, okay, this is going to be the ending of the movie. He says to the father, just walk up. And the father does walk up and they embrace. And I thought, okay, is this up to our, our mind that this is in the son's head or is this actually what's happening? But then they show the son writing this down and the camera, you know, is, is where they live. So then it's definitely up to interpretation. This is not definitive. I don't think that's a definitive ending that that is what happens. That in the future, the son makes money and he gets the house and lives with his father. I think that's either in his head of what could happen or that is what happens. But the key to this is the father tells him, don't make plans. And the son is saying, I have a plan. And that's the plan. So I think that's the key in it not being reality is the fact the father tells him not to make plans and he makes a plan. So the plan most likely is not going to work out. But if you want to be more optimistic and look at the film in a different way, the plan does work out, and one day he is reunited with his father. The mother, father, and son are reunited. Which, you know, I don't have a problem with either one of those endings, quite frankly, because it's powerful either way. Although the n more negative side of my personality prefers that it doesn't go that way. What's great about this movie, though, also, is that those could be movies in themselves. I would have just watched a movie about these con artists living in this house. I would have watched a movie about these people living in a bunker underneath this house and the family upstairs being up there. It really plays with that, the, the downstairs, upstairs, old story or something like the people under the stairs or there's something underneath your floor uh, and just reinvents it in a really creative new way by making it a class struggle. Because obviously the poor family, the poor people are down below the rich people living in a bunker like the basement in their apartment. And the rich people are up above them. They're up high class, low class. I mean, it's very straightforward. But by mixing that subtext with an old school story technique, an old school genre trope, that's what makes it all feel so fresh. Because that trope still works. That, that idea still holds up. But he adds these layers of, of text to it. Um, of themes and ideas and uh, there's ideas and dialogue and this film could have been more psychological it could have been more serious it could have been more of a uh, of a character study but it never fails to be entertaining it's completely watchable the entire time but i would have watched any one of these things i would have watched a story where you know the family moves in under the bunker and the and the daughter knows about it of the rich family and, and gives them food i would have watched a story where you know, they comedically have to work with this housekeeper and her husband to to keep the con going. They have to bring them into their game, which would have been really fun. I would have wa I would have liked this to just be a full on horror movie. You know, there's a part where the housekeeper and her husband are holding them hostage uh, because they have footage on their phone that will reveal who they really are. And they're making them all hold their hands up like this. And I'm like, you know, this could get dark, man. Like this could really turn into like. They start making them do stuff, you know? Um, 
So th- that point, I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought maybe this will get really dark like that or really funny like that. I kept wondering. But I think now that, that was just him setting you up to think that way. But I feel like when he wrote this movie, he didn't know where it was going to go. I don't get the sense that this screenplay was all figured out. I feel like they had a good idea and they fig- they. I don't think he knew what was down underneath the house. I don't think he knew where the story was going to go. I could be wrong, but my sense is is that this all happened very organically. He just put these characters in situations and then figured out a way to get there. But he had these little things that he, that he, you know, had that he knew he could connect to keep it all together. Uh, so, so it's a film with many movies in it. Uh, it's not just one movie and all of these movies could have been a good movie on their own. So it's richer because he chose to do multiple movies. Like I said, my only issue is that, you know, some of it does seem awfully convenient contrived. Uh, and maybe the rich couple comes off a little too stupid. I think, I think the dad would have caught on to this a little bit more, but maybe they're just not noticing it because they're so wealthy. They wouldn't think that anybody could get in over on them. Uh, having said all that though, uh, like I said, the acting is the best ensemble cast I've seen in a long, I really loved everybody in this movie and they felt like real people and the, and the charisma of the cast and, and just some of the sequences, like there's a scene where, the sun is hiding under a bed and a dog's barking at him and the way it's shot, the way it's composed is just so fucking gorgeous. And them having to sneak around, there's a scene where the father's dragging himself across the floor and is only hidden by shadow. And then the little boy wakes up the sleeping parents on the couch on a walkie talkie. There's moments like this that are terrific. There's a fucking cut that's so good where once you find out that the guy lives underneath the house, he's down below the mother says something happened to my son when he was uh, in first grade. He saw a ghost and she looks down at the floor and you see a cake on the floor and they use that cake as a transition to the past. It's, it's a, the, the apocalypse, the worst storm in the world's coming apparently. Like if you, I don't know if you can hear it, but the wind outside is insane. I was driving home and my car was like, it was like just getting knocked back and forth. You see the scene and the little boys eating the cake on the floor and it's like, God, what? Like I said, simple. That's not complicated. It's such a good reminder to filmmakers. Like, no Marvel movie has something that's simple and beautiful. It's just, yeah, go down to the floor. There's a cake already there. Use that to go into a flashback. That's simple. Then you see a head pop up from the basement and these eyes and the little boy's like, it's a ghost. Now it's a ghost movie. But we know as the audience, it's that guy. But the little boy thinks it's a ghost how even that fucks with you uh because i also think this movie's about privacy in the world we live in that you don't have privacy that everybody's watching you everybody's in on your life that a ghost story is actually somebody living inside of your house story uh which i thought was such a great way to play on that 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 you don't that people are really in too involved in your lives they read your diary they know everything about you and you don't even realize who these people are that feels like technology and where we're at um and and our relationship with our government and and um but but i yeah i don't think this was a was the rich or evil and the poor i think it was just this is what capitalism is this is what happens to people and uh this is especially neoliberal capitalism um and this is uh, the struggle of humanity and, and the mistakes following you and how they pass down to your children, um, which is what makes the father's character so tragic and so powerful at the end. That's really what makes it an emotional film is the father who sneaks up on you, which was very well done. And clearly that was the idea was like, let's let the father be the sneak up character on this, because really it's the son's movie for a good chunk of it. Which, like I said, I just love this guy. Like, I would love to see this kid in other movies. He's so talented. Um, the, the mother, the way she is, just how fucking ignorant she is. And they talk about, if I was rich, I could be nice too. All terrific. Very, very fun movie, though. Everyone in the theater was laughing. Um, everybody was, you know, in, into it. Um, I went with somebody who's not into movies like this and they were into it. It has a lot of mainstream appeal. I think that's why it's done well here in America and was a huge hit internationally. It's his highest grossing movie. So if you're a fan of the filmmaker, I definitely recommend it. But it's a nice introduction movie to his style because he's really been doing this stuff for years. 
if you're a fan of him, he's been doing this kind of stuff since Memories of Murder. Memories of Murder does all of this too, where it's a it's a it's comedic and all that, but also, you know, a procedural, a serious one too. And you play with time, um, and the host, you know, about a family and stuff like this. He's always done this. It's just this is the first time I think he's really going to become like a household name. I think Snowpiercer, a lot of American audiences got to know him because they watched it on Netflix, but. I think this is really going to make him a bigger name than he's ever been. I think this is going to make him like a major director where he's going to get much bigger projects and everyone's going to be saying his name. Um, Cause it's just that kind of, it's just that kind of movie. It's just going to, it's just this big zeitgeist movie. Like I said, an American version of this movie would have just been a hit and people are going to say, oh, I don't want an American remake. As I'm not saying I want one. I'm just saying that this would be a hit movie had it been an American movie in the States the same way this is a hit. It just works. It's just the screenplay just works. Um, so I wouldn't be upset if this won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay. Uh, I love this movie. I love Parasite. I don't totally know what he's saying by the end of the movie. Maybe he's saying so much or maybe it's just it went over my head. I, I think I have an idea of what he's kind of saying, but I didn't quite know what he was totally saying about about class. But it's a it's a beautifully shot movie um it's a wonderfully edited film uh the acting is as as good as i've seen in in years and it's one of the best films of the decade and the decade's almost over and here we are in 2019 and this is one of the best films of the last 10 years it's one of the best films i've seen in the last several years for sure the last two or three years um i i think of like good time by the safety brothers three billboards uh her by spike jones this is right up there with those movies this is one of the the best films I've seen in a long time. Um, so I'm just so happy that we got a movie like this. I'm glad that it's doing well. And it's, uh, it, it was, it was, I was very pleasantly surprised that it the movie that it was not, not the movie necessarily turns into, but that the movie that it was, was a pleasant surprise and that I was laughing so much. I was laughing so hard at the beginning of this movie um, I've heard some people already start to say it's overrated. I don't really get that. I think this is a great. Maybe it's obvious in its greatness. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, I give Parasite a 9 out of 10, a solid 9 out of 10. Maybe a 9.5, but I'm just going to go with a 9 right now. I don't think it's a 10. I don't think it's a masterpiece. Um, because like I said, it, 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 I don't know. It's not that it's sloppy. It's just that you know, it's it either needed to be longer or it needed to be tighter. I'm not really sure. I, I feel like I could have watched another hour. I really feel like this could have been a three-hour film. It was so relaxing, too. It was relaxing. I'm, I I had flashes of the movie Yee Yee by Edward Yang. Uh, I would love if Criterion released this, by the way. So I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. If you haven't seen it, what the fuck are you doing? Go see it. Uh, definitely the best foreign language film I've seen so far this year. Um, but the best movie I've seen so far this year too, and uh, probably an instant classic. It, it's it, it's something I don't like to say, but it's probably an instant classic that's going to be watched for a, a long time. And it's uh, I don't know. I was just telling people at work about it today, and they were all into it when I was talking about. It. They're like, "What?" I was telling them about seeing you know the thing where they find out the housekeeper has the allergies and the way that they make her sick with the allergy and the way they do that with the, I mean, it's just so good. It's just so fucking good. Um, I'm jealous that he was so clever and I'm so stupid. Um, the beer is empty. So this review is over. Thank you for watching.